Hello, and welcome to The Discriminating Gamer, the board game review show that recently lost something. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to go ahead and take a look at Axis and Allies Anniversary Edition from Wizards of the Coast in Avalon Hill. Axis and Allies Anniversary Edition from Avalon Hill is a 2-6 player uh, version of Axis and Allies that originally came out around 2008-2009, thereabouts, and is just being reprinted now because of popular demand. Now, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to give you a basic uh, rules overview, I'm going to give you kind of some of the ideas of what's different from, from this as opposed to other editions, and then I will give you my thoughts. So in Axis and Allies Anniversary Edition, essentially you take on the roles of one of the six belligerent nations, major belligerent nations from World War II. As the Allies, you can be either the United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union, or you can be, for the Axis, Germany, Italy, or Japan. Now, there are different ways to mix these up with less than six players. Um, in, for instance, a three-player game, one person is all the Axis. Uh, the Allies, of course, are made up of uh, one player playing Britain and the United States, one play person playing the Soviet Union. Now, there are two setup scenarios. There's a 1941 setup scenario and there's a 1942 setup scenario. Now, each scenario has its own kind of order of play, determining which nations uh, move in which order. Now, on your turn, there's kind of a procedure to what you do. The very first thing you do is you can invest uh, what money you have, what IPCs, industrial production certificates, you have in research, in which case you're going to go ahead and um, buy research tokens, and then you're going to kind of roll a die to determine um, where you go. You pick kind of which uh, research uh, track you want. You roll the die, whatever you get uh, is, is what you end up with. That gives you like, you know, improved uh, jet fighters, heavier bombers, uh, those sorts of things. Then, of course, what you can do is spend your uh, IPCs on military units. Now, every military unit in the game has a cost, and you have several different kinds of military units. You, of course, have infantry, which is kind of your, your, your most basic unit. It's going to be your fodder in battles. You, of course, have artillery um, in this uh, edition, which essentially kind of boosts your strength of your infantry uh, kind of on a one-for-one -one basis when attacking. They also uh, kind of have higher defense and attack values. You have tanks, which are kind of your, your most powerful land unit, very high uh, attack and defense unit uh, values there. Um, you can also buy fighters. You can buy bombers. You can also buy things like, uh, you can buy naval units, like, of course, battleships, aircraft carriers, cruisers, destroyers, and transports and submarines. So there's a lot of different units you can buy, and you have to determine kind of what your strategy is going to be, because that's going to dictate, of course, what units you're going to buy. You buy those at the very beginning of your turn before you know how your turn is, is worked out. After you have bought everything you need to buy, you plan your attacks. Essentially, you move all of your units into the areas where they are going to attack. Once you've decided where you're going to attack everywhere across the board, then you decide to kind of roll off individually which battles you want. So you can decide in what order you want to figure out those battles. So you roll a battle in one area, then you roll a battle in another area, then you roll a battle in another area. And how the, the battles work is essentially you put all of the units involved in that battle on the battle board. Now the battle board has the values of all the units in battle under what conditions printing printed on it. So if you are an attacker, it's got right there, it says what units you lay down if they're an attacker. If you're a defender, same thing, it says where you have, you know, where you're the defender, it also has a casualty area. So the attacker rolls first, so he's going to go ahead and kind of roll all of his value 1s. Then all of his value 2s, which hit at a 2 or a 1, value 3, so hit at a 3, 2 or 1, value 4, 4, 3, 2, 1. Uh, then the defender is going to do the same thing. Of course, if a defender takes a hit right there, you can put those units in the casualty zone. They're not eliminated yet. They still get a chance to roll because combat is simultaneous, but they will be dead at the end of the, at the, end of the combat, at the end of the round of combat. 
You go back and forth until either after a full round of combat, the attacker decides he wants to retreat, or until all units are eliminated on the board, on the battle board. Whatever land or naval units survive are placed in that new area back on the board. Air units alone cannot capture uh, spaces. They, of course, have to use their, their movement to, to fly over the area and enough movement to return to a safe landing space where they, that you've held for at least one, uh, one full round. If you, you conquer it, then, of course, you get to lay down your control marker on that area. And whatever printed IPC value on there, then, you add to your overall IPC score. Now, this is very important because that's going to determine how much money you make at the end of your turn that you can then spend next turn. Now, if you attack a capital or a few other regions on the board, uh, the defender will get to roll his AA gun. Now, an AA gun, essentially, uh, the, the player who has the AA gun is going to look and see how many attacking air units are coming at you, and he's going to roll that number of die, and for every one he rolls, then that number of AA units are uh, eliminated, or that number of air units are eliminated, so it's, it's kind of a risk when you're coming in with air, air power toward one of these AA zones. Now, if you actually capture a industrial complex, these are located in all the capitals and a few other places around the board. If you capture one of these industrial complexes, then you can produce, of course, units from there. More on that later. Now, at C, again, the same, thing, same rule, basic rules apply, except you're using um, naval units, and there's a few other units you can do there. Um, submarines get a sneak attack unless there's a destroyer present where the, cat, the, the defender does not get a chance to fire back. If you have an amphibious assault where you have units coming off of a transport, transports typically hold one of any land unit, infantry, artillery, and tank, and then they can carry another infantry. Um, if you have cruisers or battleships present, they get a one-shot shore bombardment uh, attack as well. So that, uh, that can be very helpful and useful when attacking. Also, uh, your air movement when you're flying off of aircraft carriers, uh, it, still has to, it still has to make sense. You still have to kind of make sure you you're, uh, have enough room for it to land. It can land in the same sea zone uh, where the aircraft carrier ends up, but you count it from where it takes off. So that's, that's something you've got to keep in mind as well. Now, there's also another kind of attack. This is called kind of a strategic bombing. So essentially, you can, with a bomber unit, bomb another player's industrial complex. Now, if you bomb another player's industrial complex, essentially what you do is you have, of course, first survive their AA barrage. If you survive their AA barrage, then you roll a die. The number on the die you roll essentially cripples their economy. They place damage tokens on their industrial complex and they have to pay kind of on a one-for-one -one basis, an IPC, to get rid of one of those uh, damage markers. Once they get rid of the damage markers, they're okay, but essentially what the damage markers do is they reduce the number of units you can produce from that uh, from that space. Now, as I say, every space has a printed IPC value. You could only produce a number of units equal to or less than that IPC value. So if your space has a 10, you could produce 10 units there per turn. But if you've got three damage, you could only produce seven units there per turn. So you kind of have to pay to get rid of those things. And this can add up if one side amasses a huge air armada, which is something Britain and the United States uh, often do. Uh, you can really cripple an enemy's economy because he's got to pay to get rid of those things before he can actually build units. Now, as far as these new industrial complexes that have been captured that turn, you can't produce out of them that turn. You have to hold them for one full year before you can begin to produce units out of those uh, areas. After you have completed all of your combat moves and all everything's been resolved, all the roles have been resolved, then you can go ahead, of course, and uh, do your non-combat movements. Essentially, you move your units um, that you have not uh, committed to battle, that have not fought, you can move them within their movement allowance points anywhere on the board uh, to kind of put them into position to strike later or to defend or wherever you want them. Next, you go ahead and you place your units. Again, these are the units that you um, just bought at the beginning of the turn. You place them at the factories, at the industrial complexes around the board where they're eligible for placement. After you do that, you collect whatever IPCs you've made that turn. Now, when you collect IPCs, that's based on a couple of factors. First of all, it's based on how many IPCs on the board uh, you control. So you actually add those up, and that goes on your, your national project production chart, and you can see what you get. But there's also, in this version, on your little player aid cards, you have specific conditions that will allow you to gain additional IPCs if you've met certain limited objectives. Um, so, for instance, you know, if, if uh, you hold so many territories uh, that are specifically named, uh, strategic territories historically, you gain 
certain, uh, you, you gain some more IPCs. If you deny your enemy from holding certain areas, or they're simply not holding areas, um, you gain certain IPCs. So there's different little conditions, little mini uh, conditions you're trying to fulfill to gain more money to, of course, win the game. Now, there's a number of victory cities throughout the board, and these are what you're trying to capture. So you're playing to try to capture a number of these cities. So you go ahead, um, you, of course you're looking at the capitals, you're looking at Tokyo, Moscow, Berlin, London, Washington, uh, Rome. You're looking at all of these basic capitals, but of course you are also uh, trying to find a number of other cities around the world, like Calcutta, Hong Kong, um, Honolulu. You're looking at these various kind of secondary cities, Paris, that you're trying to find and hold in order to secure victory. Um, you can play to a certain number of uh, victory cities, or, you know, if, if it looking like one side's uh, got an overwhelming advantage, of course you can call it there. But whoever captures these most victory cities uh, at whatever point in the game, as soon as they capture them, then they are the winner of Axis and Allies Anniversary Edition. Now, once again, that is just a very brief, a very bare overview of this game. Um, I mean, there's not a lot more to it than that. There are a few things. For instance, China is a, is a player in this game, but they're part of the United States and they don't get IPCs um, on their own. Essentially, they get uh, one infantry unit per every two uh, uh, per every two uh, spaces they control. Um, they also have the Flying Tigers are represented here, Claire Chanel's Flying Tigers, which were, of course, the um, uh, fighter squadron, so they get a little fighter uh, unit there, but it could only fight within China. <clears throat> so there's some different things going on there. So that's the basic rules of the game. I do want to discuss, of course, some of these differences. Of course, China is one of those differences. Um, differences from earlier editions. Um, the original Milton Bradley edition, for instance, didn't have cruisers. It didn't have destroyers. Essentially, you went from submarines to battleships. So there's quite a big gap in kind of naval power there. Um, this, this version addresses that, and we've seen this in some of the other editions as well, but this one is, of course, part of the anniversary edition. It may have been the first one to incorporate those when it came out several years ago, if I recall. The strategic bombing is a little bit different, as I mentioned. Um, before, people would just surrender IPCs here. you got the damage you got to pay uh, to take off, so that's uh, a difference here in the anniversary edition as well. Perhaps the biggest difference is the inclusion of Italy, which is its own playable country. Um, that's something, of course, we've never seen. Most editions of Axis and Allies, the global editions of Axis and Allies, have only been for five players. This one's for six, with the inclusion of Italy. Uh, also, too, you, there are a lot more... Um, spaces on the board in Russia, and this is important because a lot of times in, in, in kind of older iterations of Axis and Allies, it would not be the hardest thing in the world for Germany and Japan to kind of steamroll the Soviet Union for both sides. Here that's not as easy because Russia, uh, the, the, the actual capital of Russia uh, within the Soviet Union is kind of further inside, so this kind of, I guess, it better simulates kind of the, the German slog toward Moscow, and if the Japanese decide to join in, they'll have a slog through Siberia. So it's, it's, uh, that, that's another key difference of this edition. So what do I think of Axis and Allies Anniversary Edition? As I say, I bought this game uh, several years ago, when it came out in 2008 or thereabouts, 2009, I bought it when it first came out. Actually, just as it was disappearing from shelves, I, I bought a copy before I had to pay too much for it, although I, it, it was not an inexpensive game. It's Axis and Allies. You're going to be paying for those words, Axis and Allies. It's, it's, it's a property. It's a hot property. It always has been. So that was um, so, so. So I've actually had a copy of this game for quite a while, um, and then of course the good people at Wizards of the Coast sent it to me. I was under the impression there were some more changes made there that there weren't um, from the original. It's pretty much a straight reprinting that I could that I could see. Um, in case you don't know, in case you're a complete stranger to the show, I grew up on Axis and Allies. I started playing Axis and Allies, the original Milton Bradley version. You know, when I was a kid, uh, I think I was 12 years old, and that actually. Again, you're probably sick of hearing this if you watch the show, but playing the original Axis and Allies set me on the path I am today. I wouldn't be in Texas if it wasn't for Axis and Allies. And I say that because, of course, right now I am pursuing my PhD in, in history uh, in World War II. I'm actually working on my uh, PhD in history on World War II. And it was Axis and Allies, as a 12-year-old, that really struck my imagination. Um, I got my bachelor's degree in history. I did my master's degree in history where I actually worked on the um, German and Soviet front. I, I looked at Hitler and Stalin as generals uh, in that war for my master's thesis. Um, and now for my PhD, some years later, I'm actually working on uh, kind of the American army in World War II. So I'm, 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 I, I actually acknowledge it has a special, I have a special affection for it. It's got a special place in my heart. 
Uh, I love this game very much for that reason. Uh, having said that, I hadn't played Axis and Allies in years. I mean, I was playing Axis and Allies almost exclusively. Maybe that and maybe one or two other games for, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, that's all I played. And then, you know, about the same time I bought this version, uh, maybe a little bit later, I started getting into some other games, um, some more, and, and they were typically more different war games, and that eventually led me into the wild world, the wider world of board gaming. But uh, Axis and Allies, uh, this edition, for about a year or so, at least a year, I was playing it about once a month with some friends of mine. So, I mean, I, I played this game a ton. It's been a while, but I played it a ton. Um, and to me, this is the definitive version of Axis and Allies. This is the one I prefer. Um, I prefer it because, like I say, I like those that, that greater energy and effort it takes to actually get into Russia. Uh, in the 1942 setup, Germany already starts with some of those areas, but, but Russia's somewhat stronger that, by that point. Um, so I really like that. I like the, 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 that it's more of a challenge. The original, and, and I think one of the other iterations, it just seemed too easy for the Axis to just steamroll Russia right off the bat. This one, it's a contest. It's a, it's a game. Um, I liked, um, you know, I like the way the strategic bombing works in this game as well. I think that's a lot of fun. I like the research tracks, although I must confess I rarely go after research. I'd rather just pump my money into units, but but I do like how, I mean, certainly it's better than the original version, for sure. I really like how you, you, you uh, do uh, <clears throat> research in this version. Um, I, I like the board in general. I think it's beautiful. It's big. It's three giant sections that, 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 that come together that you use. And again, it just looks good. Now, Italy. Like I say, Italy is the biggest difference here. So is Italy that much better. It's having six player that much better. Now, this is kind of something that on one hand I like a lot and on one hand I'm ambivalent about. I'm kind of ambivalent toward it as the sixth player because honestly if I was playing a six player game, and I don't think I've ever played a six player game of Axis and Alexander Anniversary Edition. If I was a six player and I got Italy, I'd be really upset because you're not going to do much. You start the game with like 10 IPCs. You've got a few little things here and there you can do, and that is pretty much it. You're pretty much the redheaded stepchild of Germany, which I guess was par for the course, right? Um, but my point is there's not a lot to do if you're just Italy. Now, if there's less than that number of players, you are Germany and Italy. Now, I kind of like this because what it means is in the original version, if you were Germany, you could totally take advantage. You, you controlled everything not only in Europe but in the Mediterranean, it was, it was coordinated. You could use it all. Here, it forces you as a German player to be a little bit more creative because if you're landing German units in Africa or the Middle East, you don't have shore bombardments because that's the Italians. They can only do that on their turn. You can't, you can't really take advantage of the coordination in this version that you took for granted in the earlier version between Northern and Southern Europe if you're Germany. Here, it's something distinctly different. I like that a lot. I like the challenges that presents. I mean, it aggravates me when I'm playing Germany, as I did the other day. Um, but I, I really, really liked it. Um, I, I like the challenge it presents. <clears throat> um, you know, all told, it's just a superior edition. I really, really enjoy Access and Allies Anniversary Edition. Um, it's it's a fine job, and I'm super glad. And this was not available for years. And a lot of times when, my, when I did my top 100 lists, I would, I would mention this. I would say... Uh, you know, this is my superior edition. It's too, it's too bad it's not available anymore. Well, now it's available again. So I urge you to check it out. If you like Axis and Allies, and like I say, it's not the least expensive game out there because of the name, but if you like Axis and Allies, go ahead and check this one out. I think you will really get a kick out of it. I really enjoy Axis and Allies, and I really enjoy this edition. As I say, I haven't played it in years. just played it again for the first time the other day uh, to kind of refresh my memory for this review. And I forgot how much I really, genuinely enjoy Axis and Allies and how much I enjoy this edition. So the recommendation for the Discriminating Gamer for Axis and Allies Anniversary Edition is buy it. Thank you once again for joining us today on the Discriminating Gamer. As always, we ask you to please leave a comment for us on YouTube, on Get Geek, on our Facebook page, or on the discriminatinggamer.com. We ask you to please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. We are the Discriminating Gamer. And i got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I liked the beard. I enjoyed it. It was nice. But I had a kind of awkward, frightful moment not too long ago. Hello, Cody. Please <laughs> <laughs> somebody help me on my feet again. And I don't know where I'm going and I don't know where I've been. Please somebody help me on the solid ground. Oh, he's doing it!
Ahí estuvo la 